Good evening, everybody. You're all very welcome to tonight's webinar, which is called How Will Reengagement Impact on Your Training Operation? Uh, my name's Anne Halloran. Uh, my business is Intuition, and I deliver um, level six. Uh, VTAC ETNIS programs. So, of particular interest to me as I'm um, a legacy provider with QQI. And I'm here this evening to, be, um, to have Kathleen Hart Hartnett um, share her knowledge with us. Now, I've worked with Kathleen and QA services for a number of years now. Um, they support legacy providers in Ireland. I think that she works with over 60 different legacy providers. And I've always found her very expert, very helpful, and um, great, great to deal with. Now, we're talking about QQI in, in this webinar, but we have been asked to point out that you know, QA services is separate from any activities of QQI. So this is really just QA services providing uh, assistance to its clients. OK, now just before we start then, we, we just want to ask uh, a question here. Um, do you plan on re-engaging with QQI? So I'd be very grateful if you could pick one of those options. And you can see now uh, the results we're showing very shortly. And at the moment, 67% um, of you uh, are very keen on or, or planning to re-engage with QQI. So I'm sure you'll find this webinar uh, very interesting. And those that aren't sure as well, it'll help you make up your mind. So at this point now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand over to Kathleen Hartnett. Just a little bit about what's been happening with further education in Ireland over the last couple of years. As you know, um, nobody needs to point out to you the, the dramatic changes that has occurred in the FET landscape in Ireland, both at national level and at provider level. At national level, we have um, the launch of QQI last November, replacing FETEC and HETEC. We also have uh, the launch of SOLAS, which is the first the, f the Further Education and Training Authority, and we have the establish establishment of 16 local education and training boards throughout the country. All that's been happening uh, over the last couple of years on a national level, and also, of course, there's been the, the economic cl uh, climate, which has resulted in cutbacks for both private providers in terms of reduction in numbers of students and in funding for those of you who are in the community and voluntary sector. And I know that tonight there are quite a spread of providers with us, uh, some from the private uh, commercial sector and others from the community and voluntary sector. Each would have slightly different concerns but sim also would have certainly similar concerns. At provider level there's been the challenges of the changeover to the common awards. Uh, the Common Award System, CAS, and program validation and all that that incurred. Uh, and I know some of you are still feeling the pain of that. Uh, so that, that, that was a challenge in itself. There was the introduction of fees by FETAC QQI. There's now fees for uh, program validation, and there will be other additional fees as, as we move on. There's been the additional requirements for protection for learners, PEL. That's specifically mentioned in the 2012 Act, and that, again, is exercising and is, is a significant challenge for some providers to arrange protection for learners. And now, at provider level, we also have what we're calling the process of re-engagement. So given all of those changes, it is a challenging time for anybody working in the further education, but also, let's say, an exciting time. I mean, the re-engagement process is a positive development and one which we, we certainly welcome. Uh, QQI is Quality and Qualifications Ireland. It came about as a result of the 2012 Education and Training Act and you will, as you move through re-engagement you will hear a lot of re references to the 2012 Act and we always advise our clients to download a copy of the Act. You won't use it for bedroom reading but it's useful to have it for reference. QQI was the coming together of FETAC, HETAC, the Irish University's Quality Board and the National Qualifications Authority in Ireland. QQI is now responsible for all uh, educational provision from levels 1 to level, level 10. QQI recently launched their new website, uh, that's www.qqi.ie, which has a help and a search facility. And just on that note, I'd like, I know that some of you have your relationship with the legacy body, FETAC, wasn't always the most positive and constructive. Some people 
a lot, quite a lot of providers would have found difficulty in communicating with WeTech and getting responses and getting uh, feedback. That is changing, and I'm, we're glad to be able to point that out. We find that as we move through, as we work through through reengagement, there there is a new emphasis on communication, working with providers and working for providers. For instance, uh, in response to a recent consultation, QQI have committed to using plain English approach in their documentation. And any of you who who have who have read QQI or FeeTax documentation over the years will know that that's a very welcome development. So there are changes. QQI is broad, is reaching out more, is consulting more, is meeting more, and that is a very welcome development and one that will be necessary for providers as you go through the process of re-engagement. And we'd also urge you to make use of the new website. It's a, a huge improvement on the old uh, FeeTech website. Uh, and as I said, the search, we have used it quite a bit already over the two weeks, and the help facility and the search facility is very good on it. So it should be, uh, please make it a frequent port to call. Okay, well tonight we're here, and the reason you're here, the right, reason you registered with us is to, to find out a bit more about re-engagement. We're going to address four questions, basically. We're going to address, we're going to, what is re-engagement? We're going to look at how it will impact on you as a training provider. We're going to look at how much it might cost you, which is a burning question for an awful lot of you. Um, and also, what you need to do now. Uh, just a little bit of, um, a little bit of what, what is re-engagement? Re-engagement basically in a nutshell is the, it's, it's describing the transitioning and that's a, feat, a QQI term, they're using it, uh, transitioning from, the, from your legacy status as a FeeTech provider to making, agreeing a new quality assurance arrangement with QQI. So it's moving from the old FeeTech system to the new QQI system. As a legacy provider, you have you still have a relationship with QQI, but that's temporary until you transition. Uh, that there will you will be given a date by which that temporary arrangement with QQI will uh, become defunct, and you will then have to make the decision whether to re-engage or not. So the journey from the old to the new is what is is the process is called is termed re-engagement. And QQI are pointing out that the process is voluntary. Now, that word voluntary caused a bit of confusion earlier on in the consultations. It's voluntary in the sense that providers can opt to re-engage or not. Obviously, providers do not have to re-engage, but if you want to stay within the national framework and offering awards, programs leading to QQI awards, then you do have to re-engage. But it is, the process is voluntary. A little bit about what form, what it will look like. It's due to be, it hasn't begun yet. It's due to begin in early 2015. That QQI have indicated that the first providers will be contacted by QQI early in 2005 and given a date for transition by which they must have or not. By both they must have transitioned. It looks like at this stage they will begin with the providers that were. Uh, agreed to their quality assurance in 2005 were the first providers, um, and they will move through by in date order. So they expect it will take up to two or three years for everybody to transition over. Uh, 2005 providers, it looks like it would, they will be starting with 2005 providers. There aren't many. There were 15 as far as we can figure out. I, I recently did some research on the, on the, on the 2005 providers. There are 15, of those 10 are still active, approximately still 10 active, and of those not all intend to re-engage. So it looks like there will only be seven, seven or eight providers from 1005 moving towards re-engagement, so it won't take long. It's only when it moves towards providers in the 2009-2010 uh, era that there will be a bulk of numbers. The, t the policy documents have been published. They're on the QQI website, and we would we'll go back to this later on in the webinar. But we'd urge you to be familiar and to have read those policy documents very carefully. And QQI have committed to implementing a commu communications process around re-engagement. They have said in response to to submissions from providers that they will organize a series of seminars and consultations around the country coming up to re-engagement to go into it in greater depth. So again, we would urge you to make sure you know when they're on and to attend them and to, and to engage with them. So that's the format. To start in early 2005, 
moving for two or three years and based on policy documents that have already been published on the QQI website. Uh, how will it impact on you? Well, first of all, just to say, it will impact on all providers. Um, it, no matter whether you decide to re-engage or not, it will have an impact on you. It means that you will probably have to reassess your training provision. One of the major changes, the impact it will have on existing providers is, is a change in relationship. As a FeeTech provider, you were termed, you could use the term FeeTech Accredited Center. Moving forward, FeeTech will be, QQI will be validating programs, not providers. So the QQI will only be interested in that part of your operation that deals with the provision of QQI programs. Your programs will be validated. You will not be validated as a provider. So the term QQI certified or QQI recognized provider, that, that status will not exist. So there is a, a very clear change in relationship between QQI and its providers. Another thing to point out is, and, and again this is a quote, that Q, QQI is open to re-engaging with all providers, large and small. There is a fear out there, and a lot of you have mentioned it when you were registering for the webinar, is that you're afraid that the small provider is going to be, is going to be cut out. QQI have said explicitly in their, in their papers that they're open to re-engaging with all providers, large and small. It will probably be more difficult for smaller providers to re-engage, but it won't be impossible. If you can do what is required of you to convince QQI that you, you should be transitioning, then they, you will have to be allowed to transition no matter what your scale. What will QQI be looking at? They'll be looking at your capacity. Have you the capacity to do all they will require you to do? We'll go into that in a bit more detail in the next slide. They'll be looking at the scale of your operation, your training operation, and the scale of your operation in relation to QQI. Many of you will have training, our training providers, and only part of your operation relates to QQI or VTAC. They'll only, QQI will only be interested in the scale of your operation as it relates to QQI. They'll be looking at your level of activity over in previous years. How many learn, and when I say level of activity, there's a couple of very clear metrics on this. How many learners are you putting through for certification? Uh, how many programs have you validated? If you don't have any programs validated at this stage, well then you're probably not very active because almost all the old legacy awards have been deactivated at this stage. So they'll be looking at your level of activity over the previous years. They'll be looking at your track record in managing your existing quality assurance agreement. And as one QQI um, person said to me at one of the briefings, providers don't know what we know about them. They don't realize all we know about them. They're scanning websites. They do know an awful lot more about, about providers than we sometimes think they do. So your track record in managing your quality assurance agreement will be, will be very critical as you move towards re-engagement and during the re-engagement process. They'll also be looking at sustainability. Have you sustainable, a sustainable business case? And I use that word business case. For some of you in the community and voluntary sector, it won't be a business case as such. But have you a sustainable case moving forward? For instance, I was talking to a provider recently whose almost all of their training provision was to um, FOSS community employment scheme uh, learners. And I just posed the question, if that, if that, that policy, if that, that, that funding stops in the morning, your business is gone because you're totally reliant on that, on that avenue. You know, so is that sustainable? Will you be able to convince QQI that that is a sustainable business model? So that's what they'll be looking at. They'll be looking at your capacity, your scale, your level of activity, your track record, and your sustainability. Those will all be key as, as looking forward to re-engagement. Now, minimum capacity. This is what you have to be able to convince QQI that you can do. Can you design, develop, deliver, assess, evaluate, and quality assure programs? You will need to be able to convince and to have evidence to prove that you can do all of those things. What, Q, what QQI have said recently is that in the past, they have accredited a lot of very good training providers as FeeTech centers, but that is the limit to what they are doing. They are providing excellent training, but they don't have the capacity to do the other, to design, develop, 
assess evaluation quality assurance programs and you must in order to re-engage you must be able to do all of those things you must be able to provide a well supported learning environment you must have the human and financial resources in place to ensure that you can do that to, to underpin that well supported learning environment you must also have the facilities and the location so all those must be in place to provide the well supported learning environment and education, and again, I'm just, this is a quote, education and training must be a principal function of a provider seeking to re-engage. Education and training must be a principal function of a provider seeking to re-engage. Now, what QQI are saying is that does, you can have other core functions, but that education and training must be a principal function of a provider seeking to re-engage. And again, that will be very, very important. How much will it cost? I mean, this is key to the whole thing for a lot of people. A lot of you, I know from the feedback coming back in your registrations, a lot of you are, and I, I, with very good reason, are very concerned about the costs. First of all, just to let you know that the fee has not yet been confirmed, but we can safely say that it will be between four and 5,000, and that's for the, the re-engagement fee that will pay, be paid directly to, to QQI. Uh, new applicants, uh, there is a... The pro QQI opened for applications from new providers uh, last year. So far, as far as we know, they've only received one application from a new provider uh, to be a, to, for recognition. And the, their fee, the fee that's been charged to them, is five thousand euro. So it'll be in the ballpark of five thousand euro. But that will not be the full extent of it. There will be other costs involved. There'll be the cost of upgrading your QA system to bring it in 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 line with the new. Um, the new guidelines. There will be ongoing costs in managing and monitoring an, an evidence-based QA system. I know you're doing that already with your existing agreement, but it will be a lot more stringent. The bar has been set higher. Uh, it will be, it'll be, it'll be, there will be an additional investment required there. You, there will be ongoing need to invest in training and, con and continuing professional development. Um, and then there will also be QQI fees. There's, some of those fees have been introduced already, as you know, through validation, but there will be fees for all QQI services going forward. There will be fees for monitoring, there will be fees for... So that all of those things must be considered. The, fee, the application fee, the re-engagement fee is just part of it. As a very, very rough ballpark figure, we are suggesting to providers that they need to be looking at €10,000 to invest €10,000 to re-engage. Most... Of, Approximately half of that will be the app, will be the feed QQI, and the others will be in in costs in terms of um, your increasing your internal capacity, you upgrading your QA system, and all and, and all the rest of it. So that's just a very bold figure. That's not a QQI figure. That's a figure that we are we are estimating. Okay, what do you need to do now? Um, what what you there's a number of things you need to do now. You need to inform yourself. That's probably most critical. As I said earlier in the, in the presentation, this process hasn't actually started now. So what we're saying to our clients, now is the time to think and to plan and to, and to inform yourself. What do you need to do? You need to, now, and this is, some of this is very, very basic. You need to ensure that QQI can contact you. Now, that might seem very, very basic, but it's very important. A lot of providers are still telling us that they don't receive communications from QQI, that they, that, that they, don't, they know very little about re-engagement, that they haven't been contacted, they weren't invited to the consultation. It's up to you to ensure that QQI can contact you. Have, they got, when did you, have you updated your organizational chart recently with them? Do they know who the head of center is? Is the information, the emails from, from QQI going to the head of centre? Is the head of centre filtering that information down through the organisation to get to the right people? It's up to you, it's up to the provider to ensure that that's happening. Do you review the QQI website regularly? We advise our clients to make a weekly diary note, Monday morning, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you just regularly review the QQI website and particularly the news section to see what's happening. Read the policy documents. They're all on the QQI website um, and read them carefully. The, the, the devil is in the detail. There's nuances there. At first glance, they may seem relatively straightforward, but they need, you need to analyze them carefully and make sure that, you, as I said, the nuances are, are particularly important and the detail.
Sign up for the e QQI e-zine. Some of you are on this mailing list already, some may not be. Some of you may not realize that they have an e-zine. It's, it's to be published quarterly. I'm not quite sure if it's at regular intervals. But again, there's two reasons for, for, the, for this. I mean, one is that it has useful information that you need to be aware of, but it's also, um, it's also showing QQI that you're engaged with them, that you're, you're constantly, that you're keeping yourself informed, and that's important. And you also need to continuously monitor the FET landscape. Know what's happening in, re in relation to further education and training sector. So a continuous monitoring because it's changing so fast that you, it needs to be constantly monitored. The, I mentioned earlier about the new QA guidelines. The new QA guidelines were published last year for the new applicants. Uh, and uh, QQI, and we are also recommending that you all should have a copy of the new QA guidelines downloaded for reference. Review them, know them, compare them to the old ones. Compare them to the existing ones that you use yourself. Um, You'll notice when you do go through the new guidelines, and if any of you need a link or need any want to send you a copy, please let us know. Um, there is there are significant changes from from um, the existing the ones that you you already the, the quality assurance agreement that you already uh, use. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis now on governance and monitoring. Uh, providers will know will need to be able to provide statistical evidence of their monitoring in terms of KPIs, key performance indicators. That's all new. They will have to go detail their governance very clearly in very great detail. Some of the policy areas as we knew them are gone. Communications and equality, B1 and B2 as we knew them, they're gone completely. And now, and there's new quality areas. There's a new quality area which quality management is the first quality area, which is very important. And teaching and learning, obviously also very important. Uh, that's a new quality area that's been introduced. So download those gui guidelines and be familiar with them. There's also a strong focus on protection for learners, PEL, and access transfer and progression, ATP, in the new guidelines, because those two areas, PEL and ATP, protection for learners and access transfer and progression, are referred to specifically in 2012 Act, so they're legislative requirements. The emphasis on access transfer and progression, which was the old B4 in the old quality assurance uh, agreement, really there wasn't, there used to be a heavy emphasis placed on it. That's all changed now. QQI want to avoid, uh, provide, they want to avoid a situation where learners are uh, being offered, cul de sacs of learning. They don't want that. They want us to know where they fit within the national framework and how they can progress from where they are and, um, and move forward. So, use, know the new guidelines. Your relationship with QQI, as we said, we saw earlier in the poll, 67% of you intend to re-engage and 33%, the jury is out for 33% of you. Nobody, none of you here attending tonight has decided definitely not to re-engage. So what we're saying to people is business as usual if you haven't made a, de a decision. Unless you've made a definite decision not to re-engage, not to apply to re-engage, in which case you probably wouldn't be here, it'll be business as usual. Keep your options open. So continue along as if you were going to re-engage. And the first thing you need to do is ensure compliance. Make sure you're doing everything you should be doing in terms of complying with your quality assurance agreement. Keep communicating with QQI. Make sure they know you're there, you're active, you're engaged, you're, con you're, you're consulting, you're and you're managing your quality assurance. Retain evidence of the implementation of your existing quality assurance agreement. This will be very important uh, as you move towards. Evidence that you implemented your existing quality assurance agreement will be extremely important for engagement. Proof of that. It's not enough to be implementing it. It's you have to retain the evidence and have the evidence of implementation. Attend any briefings. Uh, the QI organize. Make sure they know you're there. Make yourself, make sure they know you're engaged and active. If you're invited to submit responses, any policy paper, consultation paper, submit response. Um, if you're invited to submit a response to any desk monitoring or monitoring, always respond when you're invited to respond. Again, it indicates engagement and uh, be active. Uh, another one which is important uh, is use the new QQI award brand and national framework National Framework NQF logo. There are new award brands and logos. There's a very good uh, um, 
uh, video on uh, introduced by Porrick Walsh on the QUI website uh, talking about the new award brand and the National Framework uh, logo. Make sure that you have a spend it's only about five minutes long, not even that I think. View it and use them. Use the new. Again, it shows that you, you're in touch with what's happening. And keep an eye on your level of activity. And when your level of activity, I mean, we particularly your program validation and certification. Make sure you have programs validated and that you're putting learners through uh, for certification. Uh, compliance, self-evaluation, uh, which is B9 of your existing quality assurance agreement, it's one that's often overlooked. If you check B9 of your existing quality assurance agreement, you will find, generally speaking, providers have committed to carrying out a self-evaluation every two years. But check your B9 to see that, to see. But you should be doing a self-evaluation every two years and submitting it to QQI. Uh, as I said, this is one that's often overlooked because as somebody asked me earlier, do, are you prompted by QQI to carry out self-evaluation? You're not. QQI expect you, you've agreed it in your quality assurance in B9, and they expect you to meet that, meet that agreement. It's, a, it's seen as a fundamental part of your quality assurance system. So if you were coming to re-engage, you haven't done your self-evaluation, it'll be regarded as a black, a, bla a black mark against you because it is seen by QQ as a fundamental part of quality assurance system. Uh, generally speaking, in the past, providers would usually have used self-evaluation to look at uh, a program. Uh, we are now advising uh, providers in order to make the best use of self-evaluation to use it to look at how well their QA is working, to look at their quality assurance system as it's operating at the moment and to see if it is working, where it's working well and where it's not working so well. It's, it's, it's a useful thing to do at this stage and it also will cover you for self-evaluation. So have a look at your B9, check it, see when your one is due. If you've carried out one, if you've carried out one within the last two years, then you're probably fine. If not, it's something you should look at. Uh, okay, we'd just like to say the short poll there, are you due to undertake a self evaluation in two thousand and fourteen? Uh, you just answer yes, no, or not sure. Uh, as I said, you generally do one every two years, you comply, you've agreed to do one every two years, so if you have done one since 2012, you probably would be covered. Okay, so you can see there that 51% are due to have one. Not much time left. <laughs> We've only got another couple of months. Um, so a lot of work for people to get done. Well, no, no, sorry, Anne, just in case. Am I on air now, Anne? I am. Uh, yes, you are. Yeah. No, just in case we cause any. No, there's plenty of time to get your self-evaluation done because most people won't be re-engaging. It'll be, to, it'll, as I pointed out earlier, it'll take a couple. It'll take two, two to three years for some people to re-engage. So business as usual for the moment. Okay. Continue on as if the re-engagement is not. You know, you'll hold, you'll be given plenty of time by QQI to to start the process and to to undertake the process. So business as usual in terms of self-evaluation or any of the other um, things you need to do for, to make sure you're, com you're compliant. So there's plenty of time. Okay, great. Okay, so if you want to continue on there then, Kathleen. I just, just maybe, just if anybody wants to ask any questions just, just at this stage? Yes, if you want to put them into the chat window, I've already got a yeah. few here, so maybe if I, okay. if I address those now. Um, Sandra is asking, what is the purpose of creating consortia or groups in order to re-engage with QQI? Okay, well I think the, there's another slide there, but we can, t we can talk about that, yes. Uh, that's a good question, Sandra, thank you. And we'll uh, come back to that one, yeah, okay. Um, Stuart is wondering, are existing level one programs being re-evaluated as part of the engagement process? Uh, well, the programs, it's the providers that are, are, are being assessed and not the programs. And this, it's the providers who are applying to re-engage at the moment. That's part of the re-engagement process, if I'm interpreting that correctly. This is all about providers re-engaging, not, not programs. Okay. So I can take a note of that just in case I've misinterpreted his question. And, and some people are saying, my goodness, it's an awful lot of money, you know, 10,000 euro. Um, no, again, I don't want to cause any alarm. I don't want to cause any, um, you know, because 
QQI have, and rightly so, have asked us to be very careful about not causing any alarm. As I said when I was saying that, it looks like the fee will be between four and 5,000. Okay, that's set by QQI. There will be other investments. Now, some of that will probably be covered by providers' own time in terms of investing in the upgrading of their quality assurance. So, um, you know, it, that's a very, very rough, but it, what we do want to point out is that it will be a significant investment and there will be ongoing costs. It won't be just a once-off, there will be ongoing costs in being uh, a QQI, recognized by QQI, that weren't there under the FETAC system. Okay. okay. James is asking as well, would you know um, if the expected fee for, for each validated program um, would be something like 500 euro or maybe three for a thousand euro. Have you any uh, advice yeah, on that? Yeah, just in terms of program validation fees, what, what it is, is it's, it's 1,000 euro for up to 50% of the value of a major award. So you, will, you can submit programs to the value of 55 credits for a thousand euro fee. Now most most programs are either, most the default credit value is 15. So you can submit Four, you could submit four 15 credit module uh, programs and a 10 credit module for the 1,000 euro fee. Once the credit value goes over that it's, it's, and up to a major award, it's a 2,000 euro fee. Okay. Great. And uh, um, Margaret is asking as well, um, using the FETAC logo, some um, of the students are asking about that, that it's not visible now and any advice on that? Uh, no, it's, they've changed over to the new uh, QQI, lo the new awards logo. And again, I would suggest, I mean, that the, the FETAC, they have said that they will, um, they will engage, they will have to market, they realize they'll have to market the new QQI brand because it's not known. I mean, there is no people, FETAC is known, QQI isn't known yet, and if QQI are conscious of the fact that they will have to market it. But the, the brand, the new logo, um, brand logo has been launched and providers are expected to use it and again I would urge people to look at the short video clip that's on the QQI website uh, about that. Okay. And, I mean there's no choice in that, it's just is what it is, you know. Okay, great. Now Annette is wondering, you know, what if you've done self-evaluations but you haven't submitted them to QQI yet, is that a problem? Well, yes, you're not complying with your quality assurance agreement if you haven't submitted them. I mean, the idea, uh, I mean, it's good that you've done them, uh, but I mean, it depends if you've done them, if you, you know, if you've done them within the last, if you've done a self-evaluation within the last two years and you haven't submitted it to QQI uh, or to FETAC, well, then it depends if it's still current, um, uh, but I mean, you're not complying if you haven't submitted it. So you need to carry it out and you need to submit it. Okay. But I mean, if it's still, if the information and the evaluation is still current, then I would suggest that maybe you review it and submit it. Right. Now, um, Brian is wondering how you can find out whether you're going to be one of those uh, that's going to have to work with QQI in 2015. You know, did you know the order in which uh, providers oh, yeah. are going to well, be dealt have, with? The QQI haven't confirmed that. It, they have indicated, given strong indications, that they will uh, start with the 2005 providers, as I said. But there's only about there'll only be about eight of nine of those, so it won't take long probably to get through those. It depends. I mean, if you have been recognised, if you were initially recognised in 2008 or nine or ten, it'll you can safely say it'll be. And I mean, I know the one provider who was agree the quality assurance in 2010 where it was told they were told that it'd be two years at least before they would be uh, given a date for transitioning. Great. Now Akira is wondering are there any funds funding or grants or discounts for non non for profit organizations to re-engage? Um, uh, the ANTHUS, ANTHUS the community education network ANTHUS are loving very strongly um, for a waiver of fees for those in the community and voluntary sector and I would urge any of you who are uh, who are in the community and voluntary sector to make sure that you're members of ANTHUS CEN. That's ANTHUS, that's the Adult Education Umbrella Organization and they have what they call the CEN, Community Education Network and it's, they're doing a lot of work in terms of lobbying and success. It looks like they, they will have some success in the way in relation to the waiver of fees for uh, those in the community and voluntary sector. Okay. So, um, I can give more information on that if, 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 if who would you say ask the question? That's Kira O'Sullivan. 
Yeah, if, Ke if Keir wants to email me or whatever, I can give him more information on that or any of the community involuntary sector. But I mean, it, that is a very useful resource. Okay. Now, Stuart's making the point that, and I, I think I perhaps agree with him, I'm getting the feeling, even though you didn't say it, that smaller providers are not being encouraged to re-engage. Um, we are a not-for-profit with very few learners, but in a very specialised sector, training visually impaired people as part of rehabilitative training. Okay, uh, and I'm glad, I'm very glad, Stuart, is it? Yes. Yes, yeah, Stuart, I'm very glad, because that, that's a very good point and probably one. QQI are great pains to point out that each, your, re, your success in terms of re-engagement, it'll be, it'll be, you'll be taken on the, in the context of the training that you're delivering. Each provider, each application will be taken on the basis, uh, on the, in, in a different context. If you are offering uh, a specialized training to a group of learners who may not otherwise have access to accreditation, that that will, be, will certainly be looked at. QQI is placing the learner at the center of everything they do, and access to accreditation for learners is key to what they, what they want. So if you're providing a, a route to accreditation for a group of learners who may not otherwise have access to accreditation, then that will certainly be a very good case for re-engagement. Okay. Uh, so each, each application will be taken in its own merit. So it's not true to say, and people are saying, and I mean we hear a lot that oh, the small, there will be no small providers. That isn't actually the case. As I said earlier, if you can prove QQI that you have the capacity to do what's required to do, then they have to allow you to re-engage. But each application will be taken on its own merit with specific reference to the context of the training. Okay, thank you. And now Ken Long is asking, are QQI signing up to SLAs, I presume that's service level agreements, as they are now charging for validation, but saying it will take up to 26 weeks to validate? Uh, the, the validation, it, it had been taking up to 26 weeks. They are saying that it's, it, that also actually has improved. Uh, I've seen some validations in recent times go through very relatively quickly, much quicker than it was. I mean, that backlog that existed over the past year or so seems to be getting cleared, uh, and it certainly um, it has improved. Uh, and I think, again, if you read the recent documentation come from QQI, there is more of an awareness there that if their providers are paying fees, then they, 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 they need to provide a certain level of service that probably wasn't there before. Okay. So I, just, yeah. Sorry, I think this next question is, is linked. Uh, it's from Francis. And the question is, what does it mean when a program is under review in the certification section of the website? Uh, that there is an under review um, that's that's listed for each all programs. It it means a date by which QQI are expected to review. They're supposed to review each program at, at intervals. Uh, I'm not sure how the process is or if it's always adhered to, but that's a QQI responsibility. It's not the provider responsibility. Okay. Now, um, Roisin um, is asking if you can explain again the credits versus costs for programs. I know it's a little bit complicated. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. There's two fees for validation, basically. There's a thousand euro or there's two thousand euro. A thousand euro, you can submit an application for validation for up to what we fifty-five credits worth, we'll say, for a thousand euro. So you could, could submit a number of modules. Some, some providers are under the impression that it's a thousand euro per module. It's not. It's a thousand euro for up to 55 credits worth. And then for anything more than that, it's two th up to a major award, which is 120 credits. The application fee is 2,000 euro. So it's either a thousand or 2,000. A thousand is for a number of modules, and 2,000 is for a major award. Okay, okay um, thank you. Annette Casey is wondering, you know, any idea on how long centres will get to re-engage from the, f their f from the first contact? You know, how long is uh, the process? They haven't, again, what they have said is they, that they will be given plenty of time. QQI have committed to ensuring that all providers will be, giving, will be given plenty of time to make the transition. Uh, they said they won't, they, they, they learn that they'll be plenty of time to finish out programs, plenty of time to, so I mean they have committed on more than one occasion I've seen that, they're very conscious of that. So I wouldn't be concerned about once you're, once they will be contacting the providers and they'll be giving them a transition date at some stage over the next 
couple of years. You'll be, you'll be contacted, you'll be given a transition date, and the transition date you will be given will be, as I said, they have guaranteed that you will have plenty of time to make the transition. So, the, you know, again, in terms of the whole process, there is plenty of time. Don't worry, there is no need for any alarm or any major concern. There will be plenty of time involved. Okay, now we've got a few more questions here, Kathy, but would you like to just carry on and uh, we'll get to the I'm end? almost at the, at the end. Yes. I can, I can, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, what else do you need to do at the moment? You need to look at program validation. You need to plan ahead. It, program validation will be very important it'll, because it will be seen as a measure of your activity. As I said earlier, if you haven't programs validated, uh, you can't be active. Okay, program validation will be very important. You need to plan ahead in terms of program validation. Most of you have your programs validated. A lot of you have programs validated at this stage. Some are still in the process of validating programs. But it will be seen. It's a, it's a very easy metric for QQI to measure at your activity, and it will be seen as a measure of activity. If you haven't programs validated, then you probably aren't delivering any because, as I said, most of the old ones, the legacy awards, are gone now. You may need additional programs to strengthen your capacity and strengthen your case for re-engagement. If you are a provider offering one or two modules over the last couple of years and haven't expanded or developed from that, then maybe you need to look at uh, you know, you, the scope of your provision and maybe you look at, to look at how you might strengthen your case for re-engagement. Um, the other thing, just in terms of validation, is, and this again is a quote, that seeking validation of new programs will trigger the re-engagement process for some providers. This means, in effect, that in moving forward, program validation will be tied into re-engagement. So the two will be linked together. So you won't be able to, to get programs validated without re-engaging. Now that that that's for the future, but. You know, in order to not to delay the process, it it should you should be looking at getting your programs validated ASAP because, as I said, they will be linked together moving forward. Uh, now, Sandra, I think you had a question earlier about networking and collaborating. Uh, Q, this is something that QQI is strongly recommending and encouraging people. What QQI seem to uh, want. To what they envisage is that they will have a smaller number of uh, bigger providers collaborating with other providers. Uh, how should you? How, how, how? What will this look like? I mean, it'll 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 be each collaboration will be different. Will be depend on the people who are collaborating. Each each arrangement will be different. Will be specific to the providers that are involved in it. But what you do, what you should be doing at this stage is getting to know other providers. Know the providers in your local area. Know who else is 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 within the QQI or FETAC uh, um, framework. Get to know them. Pick up the phone. Talk to them. Have a cup of coffee. Ask them how they how they're looking at towards re-engagement. Share the learning. I know um, it hasn't always been done, but it it will be it will be useful going forward. Network with others. Use use networks. I mentioned there about the ANTHIS community education network and how useful that can be for those in the voluntary and community sector. Likewise, the Irish Institute of Training and Development, the membership organization for training professionals. Membership of that is an opportunity to network. Um, you can collaborate now. I mean, providers can collaborate now under their ending B8 as long as it's quality assured. So there's nothing to, show, to stop providers collaborating now. And in fact, we're recommending to some providers that they actually test the ground in terms of collaboration now by collaborating while the, as long as it's quality assured and as long as it's written into your policies and procedures in B8. Uh, and as long as you realize that the lead provider is responsible for the QA and if there's an issue with any collaboration, it will be the lead provider that will be held responsible. So, uh, you know, again, it's time for networking, talking, thinking, meeting, engaging with others. Look at alternatives. That's something else you can be doing as well. QQI is not the only game in town. Again, QQI is saying this themselves. They're saying they're, they're encouraging people to look outside, to look and see, do you really need QQI? Is it fundamental to what you're doing? Would another accreditation be more suitable? 
For some of you in some particular sectors, City and Guilds might have better qualifications. BTEC, it, it varies. In industry, standard qualification or accreditation might be better than, you know, might, might do the same thing. You might just decide to provide non-accredited learning. Maybe FeeTech maybe fee at the moment is a very small part of what you do, and it just isn't, isn't enough to, to, to um, encourage you to re-engage. And you may just look at collaborating with others. You don't have to have a direct relationship with QQI. You can have an indirect one. Through other, through another lead provider, so that there are alternatives. I mean, QQI, as I said earlier, are anxious not to cut down the routes to accreditation, so they're urging people to look outside, to look at other options, other accreditations, providing non-accredited training, or collaborating with others and working through others, with and having an indirect relationship rather than a direct relationship with QQI. The questions you need to be asking yourself at this stage, is QQI recognition critical to your training operation? Do we really need it? Do, you know, can, are there other ways around it? Can we afford the investment or can we afford not to invest? Uh, can we or how can we work with others? And are there other routes to accreditation which might suit us better? Those are the questions you need to be forming in your own mind. You need to be talking to others about, you need to be brainstorming on, and you need to be doing, planning and thinking around those questions now. Okay, are we, can, have we any more questions, Anne, that anybody, is there any questions? Yes, we've got, we've got some great questions ask? coming in, you know, very, very uh, thought-provoking thought questions. Mm -hmm. um, because going back to the whole idea of the credits, you know, and you're paying a thousand euro. Now, suppose then you only use up 15 credits mm. and you pay your thousand. Is there a carryover? Mm -hmm. Can you use the remainder later yeah. in the year? No, it doesn't, I'm afraid. No, no. Okay. Now, the other thing is about just when, you're, when you are what we call bundling modules together, for, for they have to form what's called a coherent uh, package of learning. So the modules you would submit, if you were bundling three or four modules together for the 1,000 euro fee, there would have to be some relationship in terms of the area of the subject matter area of those. Um, but generally, providers would be anyway. So you can't carry over. No, if you if you pay your fee when you submit an application for validation, and whatever you pay, it, it you know is used at that stage. Okay. And what about online courses? Are QQI validating those? They are. They have a preference. They seem to have a pre preference for blended learning, uh, particularly at the lower levels. Um, but yes, they have validated some uh, distance or um, online. You know, people's interpretations of these things are different. But their preference is certainly is for uh, a blended approach, okay. a combination, a blending of the classroom and the and the technology. But, I mean, one thing in relation to validation, if you are applying to get a program validated and you, uh, you, you um, advise them that you intend to use a blended learning approach, they will ask you, the, the, they will need to have access to your blended learning materials, your online materials, before they validate the program. So if you submit uh, an application saying that you're going to use blended or learning or online learning, you will have to have the program materials ready for them to view to evaluate as part of the evaluation process. Okay, uh, thanks for that question, Francis. Now, um, Samantha is asking here, does the initial fee of four to 5000 need to be paid at the outset of re-engagement? And what happens if you're not successful? Do you get your money back? Uh, well, I, I, again, these details wouldn't be confirmed, but I'd imagine it'll be, it'll be very similar to what the new applicants are, what's happening with the new applicants at the moment. Once you pay your fee, it's non-refundable. If you're a new applicant now applying for the first time and you pay your 5,000 euro fee as it is for, for new applicants, if you get to the stage where you're applying, uh, it's non-refundable. They expect that you, they expect providers will have informed themselves enough to know or to have a very reasonable idea of whether they'll be successful or not before they actually go ahead and apply for the re-engagement. Um, it, it, they haven't confirmed whether it'll be paid at the outset of re-engagement. It looks like when you're submitting your application for re-engagement that the fee will be pay, payable with it, as, as that's what's happening with validation, that's what's happening with new applicants. When you submit your application, your fee goes with it. Okay, and uh, regarding pr protection for learners, do all centres need this regardless of program length? That's a question from Annette. 
uh, protection for learners apply, there's two conditions for the two conditions under which protection for learners apply. One is if your program is of three months or more duration, and the other thing is if, if learners are paying fees or fees are being paid on their behalf. If you if your programs meet those two conditions, then you need protection for learners. So if the program is more than three months in duration, if the learners are paying fees or somebody is paying fees on their behalf, then you need protection for learners. Great. Now, a question then about the collaboration. Um, what, what, what if you have no provision in your, your quality document for, for B8, and now you want to look at collaborating with a larger provider? You can, you can, you, you can look at, at um, you can devise policies and procedures around it now. As long as it's quality assured, and as long as you have policies and procedures around, um, and you have evidence to, to prove that it is quality assured, as long as, you know, you, you, you can draw up your policies and the procedures and ensure that anything, uh, any, any collaboration is quality assured and you take responsibility for it and you retain the evidence because as we all, any of this is all, it's all an evidence-based quality assurance system, the old and the new. So retain the evidence to prove that it is quality assured, then you know, you can collaborate at the moment. A lot of providers are collaborating at the moment. I mean, that, that, that is quite commonly used. And a few people are actually asking the question, can QA services set up a consortium and become a QQI centre, um, mm -hmm. which we could run our courses via? <laughs> um, it's, something we're, it's something we're looking at. It's something we're looking at. It's something I have mentioned to QQI. Um, I, I'm not sure how it would work. Uh, managing somebody else's quality assurance can be difficult. Okay. Uh, you know, and if you're working, if you're managing a number of people's quality assurance, if one one provider goes AWOL, then it, end it endangers everybody else. So it's, collaboration is not going to be easy. You know, you need, there needs to be trust, and it has to start with trust. And, and people say to me, how do I know who I should collaborate with there? How will I know? And I mean, I suggest, I always say, the first thing is sit down and have a cup of coffee with somebody and have a chat with them. And if you haven't a good feeling after that, or if you have any question marks in your mind after that, you know, probably you're better walk because you need to trust who you work with because you're trusting your quality assurance to them. Okay, ju just again, I mean, I will, Pete, and I will reiterate because I could, I could have QI on me in the morning about causing alarm. Um, the, the only thing, no, nothing has been set in terms of the fees as yet. But I mean, there will be an application fee, and that, you know, we can almost say with certainty that would be between four and five thousand euro. Uh, the, you, I have no doubt that, and I know what happens with the new providers. Um, uh, sorry, I just uh, lost focus there for a second. Um, you will know at the end of the communications process. You will ha you will be fairly confident if you've decided to reapply whether you'll be successful. Or not, so you know you shouldn't be in a situation where you'll be where the money would be gone. I mean, you'll know when you're applying you're, that you have a good chance of success. So I wouldn't get, but I mean, you, at the same time, you do need to be looking at an investment. There is, a, it's a major investment. There will be the fee, and there will be a lot of time and a lot of headspace and a lot of resources into bringing you. We've seen it with the new applications going through now for the first time. It's, it's quite an intensive process. It's quite a demanding process. It's not going to be, I mean, those of you who considered that the original application was, and I know some of, a lot of you do, was torturous, this is, the bar is higher and the, the requirements are more detailed. So, you know, I'm, on one hand, I'm trying not to cause any alarm or to cause, but I mean, you do need to be aware that it is a demanding process going forward. Okay, I just, just how can we help? How, what do we do that will help providers with re-engagement? Well, the first thing we do is we keep our clients and providers, we keep you informed. We keep, you know, we alert you when something is, is important. Now, it's important that you keep yourself informed, but we also will help to keep you informed. We, a lot of our work at the moment is in terms of training to enhance internal capacity. You may need to, in, uh, we find that more and more providers are looking for small bite-sized pieces of training, workshop training in areas like internal verification or streamlining learning evaluation or self, any of those areas. So we're, a lot of our work is in training in order to enhance your internal capacity. We benchmark existing QA systems and carry out QA audits for people on their existing systems. We coordinate responses to QQI consultations. We advise and facilitate collaborations and networks. 
uh, we facilitate protection for learning arrangements, we advise on other routes to accreditation, and we act as self-evaluators, external evaluators for self-evaluation. So that's some of the ways that we help uh, the, our clients in terms of re-engagement. We also do a lot of work, obviously, with program validation, um, but that's not directly linked to the re-engagement, but it is linked, but not, not directly linked. So that's some of the ways that we can help you. Um, I'd just like to say, maybe finish my presentation on a positive note. We welcome the process of re-engagement. We are fairly confident that what will be, what will we all know, and I mean, it's no secret that there is variations in the standards quality out there. I mean, we're we're absolutely sure of that. You know that, and we know that. So we we would expect that what at the the outcome of this process will be probably a smaller number of providers working to a very high standard and everybody meeting the national standards. So you can be confident, or learners can be confident, that no matter where they take a program, it's the same national standard they will be achieving. We're wel we welcome QQI's efforts to engage positively and constructively. That is a very welcome development, and one which you can be, which is helpful for you as well as you move forward. They are making increasing efforts to engage positively. We, as I said, we expect that there will be higher standards across the board. The focus on the welfare of learners is central to all of it, and that's what we're all, it's what it's all about, really, is the welfare of the learners. It'll, be, it's a, it'll provide an opportunity for providers to reassess where they are, re-strategize and plan, to look at their whole operation and perhaps think of avenues and re, reinvent themselves in some ways that they may not otherwise have done if they didn't have this opportunity. It'll be an opportunity for providers to think outside the box. So it's not all, I know there are, there are concerns, there are concerns about costs, there are concerns about the, what's involved, the resources involved, but all in all, it's, it, we welcome the process. The outcomes should be very good for everybody that's left, for the providers that's left standing at the end, then the outcomes should be, should be very positive. Uh, I'm just putting up our, our contact details there. Just our, we're actually uh, investing in a new website at the moment, it'll, so uh, it'll be in, we're enhancing our website, but our existing one is still live for the moment. Um, and also draw your attention to, in terms of, of our next seminar, which is a face-to-face -face seminar in terms of building internal capacity, a lot of our providers at the moment are looking at e-learning and want to get started in the area. A lot of you on your a long way down the line and could probably give this seminar, and I hope your input, you'd like, it would be great if you could input into it. We're building an e-learning capacity on a shoestring budget which we're hosting in Ennis on the 17th of November. It's how to get started in e-learning, basically. Uh, w w with a limited budget. So some of you might be, uh, that might be of interest to some of you, and you can book it through Eventbrite. Uh, we'll be letting you know about it separately anyway. Um, so that's, that's the end of my presentation. I know Anne said there's a lot of questions. Who determines, you know, who is a lead provider? Uh, that, that's, that would be between whoever is collaborating, you know, I mean, that's okay. the decision, the concept, there used to be the concept of first and second provider in the old QA system, uh, that now, that, that use of that language is now, is no longer, they're not using the, that terminology, QQI is no longer using that terminology, but it will, I mean, as I said earlier, each collaboration will be specific to the people who are collaborating, so, I mean, I suppose in, 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 Normally, it would be maybe the bigger provider, but not necessarily. It just depends. It va it'll vary from arrangement to arrangement, and each arrangement will be different, probably, you know. Okay. Thanks, but, um, thanks for that, Maura. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and Francis is also asking, can we work with a VEC, if possible? Uh, Yes, um, you can certainly, I mean, I know some of you are under the old system, I mean, it, there's, nothing, there's nothing to prevent you from working with the, with the, with the local, uh, the ETB, the Local Education Training Board. Uh, some of you, I know, have relationships already, particularly those of you in the community and voluntary sector, but also I know, I think um, Francis is asking the question, probably maybe has a relationship with, but so certainly it's worth exploring. I mean, everything is worth, it's all up for, you know, up for grabs at the moment, and it's, it's exploring. You know, and they will have service um, level agreements as well. They'll probably be looking for uh, private providers to, to, to link with private providers. So certainly worth exploring. Okay. And a uh, question here from James. Will QQI awards be possible for Northern Ireland participants with PPS numbers? Also, will certain awards be recognized outside Ireland and the, in the EU, EU i.e. training and development? Uh, will it be the same for a German citizen as well as an Irish citizen? 
the, maybe we'll take that question separately. Okay. It's quite detailed. It is. And, uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. There's some very specific questions here, so I'm, I'm assuming that Kathleen, you'll get back, back to people individually on yeah, those. Yeah, I can. Yeah, I can get back. Okay. To people. Samantha, I think, is asking a question there. Samantha, if you intend to make programs available for sharing, do you need to be named as part of the initial application? That's in relation to program validation, is it, I think? Um, uh, they do, yes. If you intend to share a program, you will have to, uh, you'll have to indicate this on your application for validation, if I'm reading that question right, Samantha. And can I ask you a question for myself, Kathleen? Suppose and I... I uh, I take on other providers and I start, uh, you know, being responsible for their mm. accreditation. And supposing there's an issue with, with a learner, uh, where does the responsibility lie? Is it with myself or is it with it, the it's um, with, it's, You see, that it's, with, it's, it's your quality assurance. So uh, if there's an issue, it's, it lies with you. Basically. So it is that's a responsibility. To, it is a responsibility, yeah. It's going to be, uh, and that's why... As I said, collaboration has always, there's always been the facility to collaborate, uh, uh, but it wasn't always done properly, let's say. It wasn't always fully quality assured. But, I mean, whoever, that's why there is, I suppose, a danger or a concern about collaboration or something that needs to be at least worked out carefully, is that if it's your quality assurance agreement uh, that's, that's been used, then it's, it's your quality assurance agreement that's in jeopardy if, if there's an issue. Okay. So you have to, you know, it's your responsibility. Okay, so it's not something you should do lightly, you should think about that. It's not something you should do lightly, no, no, no. And that's why I was, I was saying earlier, trust will be fundamental to this because, you know, uh, if, if you don't trust who you're working with, it's going to be very difficult. And again, a lot of uh, small training providers are often in competition with each other, so it, that's a new thing to be actually collaborating. Well, people say to me often about, you know, who should I or how... how Collaborate. What I and these are very, very general rules. Come, they're not. I mean, I know it's it's possible to collaborate somebody at a remote and to, to you know to communicate virtually. But it's off. It's all. It can be very useful if you're collaborating with somebody that you can meet occasionally. That's not geographically too far away from you. That's of similar size uh, and you know and scale.